Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians, where Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have learned while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. On today's episode, we interview Dr. John Ramey, a fellowship-trained allergist in Charleston, South Carolina, and the creator of drmoves.com. That's Dr. Moves. And I know what you're thinking, the doctor of dance moves. Okay, that's probably not what you were thinking. That's what I was thinking. But Dr. Moves helps doctors to move. He and his wife are real estate agents who own healthyrealty.com, and he walks us through why you may or may not want to buy a home as a resident, how to do it, And if you don't buy one then, how to buy one as a new attending. We discuss what doctor loans are and why you may want to utilize them. And then we walk through the entire process from finding a real estate agent to closing costs. And we really just scratch the surface and he offers much more detail on his website. Again, drmoves.com. He also has useful information on real estate investment and other revenue streams for physicians like being a medical reviewer, expert witness, medical surveys, telemedicine, and locums jobs. Welcome back to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. On today's episode, we have Dr. John Ramey of drmoves.com. He has a fantastic website that gives all sorts of information to physicians about uh, finding a real estate agent, finding a home, um, earning extra income through either real estate or uh, medical surveys, becoming a medical reviewer. Really, he has lots of different information, uh, is a wealth of information for, for physicians. But today, we're going to focus on buying a home. So if you're a physician who, or you, you recently became a physician because you recently matched, um, or you're finishing residency, you're about to become an attending, you know where you're going to be living for a while, and you're thinking of buying a home, as a physician, you might have some other obstacles like your loans that other people don't and there might be some more resources available to you that aren't available to other people like a physician specific loan and so dr ramey has some particular expertise in in this area for a whole host of reasons so first of all dr ramey thank you so much for being on the podcast today well thanks for having me i'm really excited to be on with you tonight so i think your real estate experience um first started with your experience as starting, I think it was you were starting your residency and you were looking your first home. So can you walk us through what happened there? Yeah, it's actually um, getting ready to start medical school. So um, my, actually my fiance at the time, um, we were um, wanting to buy a house and like most medical students, we didn't have any money. We had just graduated from college. And so we um, went, to look for houses um, with my in-laws. So first suggestion I have is don't go look for houses with your in-laws. It wasn't a very good experience. So um, we um, were actually staying at a resort and the um, closest real estate office was a resort um, real estate office. The second mistake we made was um, finding a realtor who was used to selling million dollar properties, which we were not looking for at the time. So um, she took us out for the day and we were looking in the $100,000 range at that time. Um, we actually found a house that we really liked, and this was just after one day of looking. And so the realtor takes us back to our office, and she goes into a spill saying, hey, listen, uh, this is a, sell- a seller's market. If you don't put an offer on this house today, you're probably going to lose it. You need to do something quick. And um, I was very nervous, you know, being my first house and buying a house. I, you know, I wanted to call my parents and get some advice from them. And my parents were kind of cautious. And they said, hey, John, don't you really want to think about this overnight? I don't think you should rush into this. And so, you know, I, agree, I agreed with them. I wasn't in a big hurry to do this. So I walked back into the room with the real estate agent and my in-laws. And I told them, I said, listen, I, I want to think about this tonight. I want to, you know, make sure this is a good decision. Well, the realtor um, got really upset with me and said, you are going to lose this house tonight. This is a terrible decision. And she stomped out of the room. Um, the next person got upset with me with my mother-in-law. She stomped out of the room and, um, my fiance at the time was crying. You know, it was just a, a bad real estate experience. And from that experience, you know, my, my wife and I talked about it several years later and we were just like, 
man, we could have done such a better job ourselves. And it, you know, inspired us to go get our, both of us to get our real estate license. So you got a real estate license while you were a medical student? No, no, it was actually um, after I finished up all my training, I got mine. Um, my wife got hers um, during my fellowship, and um, so she got it before me. And so um, she was able to actually to help us buy our, this was our, I think, third house by that time um, when we moved to our um, my final job as an attending. Your third house? Yes. So the first house ended up happening during, at the beginning of medical school? Well, what ended up happening, that house that we were going to buy, we didn't buy, and um, we decided to rent instead. So we ended up renting a townhouse for the first two years. Then we went to the owner and said, hey, we'd really like to buy this. And um, bought it um, at, during the start, I guess, the end of my second year of med school and sold it two years later for a profit. And then uh, went on to residency, bought a house there, um, ended up breaking even on that one. And then during um, fellowship, bought another house and ended up making a good profit on that house. And that was during the time my wife got her real estate license. So it was actually our fourth house that um, we ended up um, using her as the realtor. So you're buying and selling these houses. You're not holding them as rental properties. Not at that point, we weren't. And, you know, that's, you know, one piece of advice that, you know, I would make to residents or attendings is, you know, look at, you know, the property you're buying and may, you know, be a um, good rental property over the long term. And that's not something I was looking at at that point in my um, career. Yeah, I actually, when I was a resident, I bought a, um, I bought an apartment and my parents helped me to finance it uh, because the first apartment that I lived in, in Washington, wasn't in the best area. So when I would uh, leave at 5.30 in the morning to go to my rotations, there were still hookers outside. So oh my they, uh, they, they helped me to put a down payment on, on a place, uh, you know, but I was a resident from 2006 to 2011. Um, so possibly the worst time to buy, <laughs> to buy an apartment. And then at the end, we just, you know, we didn't want to, because I was moving back from Washington, D.C. to New York, we didn't want to be long distance um, a landlord. So we decided to just sell it and, and took the loss. But um, in retrospect, you know, it might have been a better idea to to hold on to that and use it as a rental property because that place, I just, it had so many amazing things about it. And I think that gets to something we're going to end up talking about later is there are some inefficiencies in the real estate market that you can capitalize, meaning like the stock market is supposed to be completely efficient. Everybody has all the same information at all the same time, but the real estate market if you're going to be living in a place for a while, you're really going to be invested in looking at a lot of places and doing your research and doing your due diligence until you end up deciding on a place. And that research has some value to it. So if you hold on to it, you might be able to find something that is undervalued or underpriced and then, and then turn it into something. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, So, you know, we got our real estate light. My wife got a real estate license around 2003. I, I got mine around 2005. And um, like you said, the real estate market crashed around the 2006, 2007 period. And, you know, we dealt with a lot of residents, especially who bought during those years. And, you know, it was real hard for them because they, like you had graduated and they had to make a decision, you know, should they sell their house for a loss or should they keep it and hopefully hold out until the pricing um, had recovered. And, um, you know, most of them actually ended up selling for a loss because like you, they didn't want to, they were moving away. They went and didn't want to have to keep managing it from a distance. But, um, you know, a funny story, we, we had a, um, a resident who kept their um, townhouse and he is just selling it now from that 2006, 2008 time period. And he's actually finally, you know, um, able to make a little bit of profit um, after all those years. So he kept it and rented it, you know, out um, to help it recover back to its baseline. Yeah, so there are ways that even if something like that happens, hopefully it won't be uh, for some extremely extended period of time to to protect yourself against against loss. But there is, you know, like any investment, there's going to be some some risk involved. So so your wife is a real estate agent. You're a real estate agent, and your website, Doctor Moves, you. You named it Dr. Moves, presumably, because you help doctors to move, correct? Correct. So, um, 
So I, I, start, I joined an allergy practice in Charleston, South Carolina in 2006. And at that same point, um, my wife and I started our real estate company in, in Charleston, South Carolina. We called it Healthy Realty. And initially, we really just focused on helping doctors relocate and did that mainly for the first few years. But as the company began to grow, we started doing a lot more online advertising and you know, we grew to where we were helping anybody buy houses. Um, we did a lot of um, Zillow advertising over the years, not really, you know, took us to another level in the real estate company. But, you know, with all that, we probably have worked with over, you know, 200 physicians in the Charleston area over the last um, 10 years. And a few years ago, we, we started to think, you know, we've learned a lot through this experience, how physicians are different than other buyers and sellers. Um, and, you know, learned a lot about doctor loans and we said, Hey, we can, you know, teach the same thing that we've been te- teaching people in Charleston for years, you know, through a, a website that helps people relocate, re- relocate nationally. And so that's kind of how DR moves came about was from just our experience in the Charleston market. We kind of went that wanted to share it with, you know, people across the U S so let's say you have a, a med student that just graduated from MUSC and he spent some time with you in the allergy office and he comes to you for some advice saying he's moving to X city for residency and he's thinking of buying a house there. What are the steps that you're going to take that, that physician through to make sure that they're making the best decision for them? Yeah. So that's something I, you know, have a lot of passion about and I've been doing that for about 10 years of actually um, been lecturing the students at Medical University of South Carolina on that, you know, decision process. And, you know, the first thing I encourage them to do is sit down and make a budget. I mean, that's the best thing you can do before you start thinking about whether to buy or rent is sit down and make a budget. You know, figure out, you know, what is your salary going to be after taxes? How much money is going to be left over? And then figure out, are you going to start paying on your student loans or not? And then figure out, you know, what's your other costs going to be and kind of figure out, you know, how much money you're going to have left over for housing costs, whether that's to buy or rent. One of the worst decisions, you know, I've seen with um, residents is getting in a house that they can't afford. I mean, there's nothing worse than having all the pressures of residency and having to worry about, you know, can I make my house payment every month? And so the way to, you know, avoid that, and again, I can go with buying or renting, is just to sit down and, you know, figure out what your budget is. And there's a lot of great online resources to help you do that. So once you figure that out, you know, the next step, I think, is, you know, to figure out, you know, do you want to buy or rent? And I think, you know, there's definitely, you know, we always, you know, with the people we work with, we try to, you know, get them to make the best decision for, them, for each person because each person is different, like you said, you know, you went to Washington, D.C., you know, so a lot of times it's harder for people in these big cities to afford properties um, on a resident salary. So that's one of the first things to figure out, you know, can I afford a property close enough to the hospital? And some cities you can and some cities you can't. Um, And then, you know, after that, you know, the next thing to ask yourself is, you know, do I want to deal with the problems of, you know, owning property? Because, you know, owning property is always something to deal with. And, you know, there are some people out there who like dealing with that kind of stuff. And there's some other people that don't. And so if you're one of these people that would not enjoy dealing with a um, HVAC system breaking, um, one of the things that happened to me the house that we bought, I don't want to run a way rotation. And um, a pipe popped out um, on the second floor of our house. And we had water coming down from the second floor to the first floor to our basement. And we had our next door neighbor call me while I was on a way rotation and say, hey, John, you want to, you may want to come back. Um, you have water flowing out of your basement. And um, we had about um, $100,000 worth of damage. And we had to move out of our house for three months during the middle of residency. Oh, the fortunate wow. thing was that we had homeowners insurance and, it, you know, it covered everything except the $1,000 deductible. But still, you know, it was, it was a big headache and having to deal with that you know, is not fun during residency. I actually had something similar happen to me. 
Uh, I had a link. I had a leak. I was at the fifth floor of an apartment building, and there was a. Le- but I was there. There was a leak coming out of the sink, from under the sink, oh, wow. right where the valve is. So I tightened the valve, and then it got worse. And I thought maybe I'm just an idiot, and I turned the valve the wrong way. So I turned it the other way, and it got worse. So every time it got worse, and it got worse because the leak was between the wall and the valve. So. Oh, wow. So ultimately, the place is flooded. Someone ended up calling the fire department, and they came in, and they just crimped the pipe. Um, maybe I should have known to do that, but, you know, the panic was uh, not helping, and I, there ended up being quite a, quite a bit of damage to the place. Um, and in New York, where I'm from, um, you can't buy a place without homeowner's insurance. They won't let you. In Washington, D.C., they, they do. So I assumed, just like in New York, it was just rolled into the mortgage. It was not. I had no homeowner's insurance. That was a big problem. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, that's one thing you got to, you know, look into when you're buying a home. You got to make sure that you get homeowner's insurance and then, you know, know your deductible. Because again, on a resident salary, you know, if you have a thousand dollar deductible or two thousand dollars deductible, you need to make sure that you can afford that. If you, you know have you know something catastrophic happen like flooding or fire or a hurricane, you know anything like that, you just want to make sure that you can afford that. If you you know decide to buy a property, is there any good formula like a, a quick and dirty for the resident salary? what you think would be a reasonable amount to spend? I, I know it's a personal decision, but certainly there are some for like 40% of gross or, or something like that. Yeah. You know, the, the, the one that I hear a lot is somewhere between 30 to 35% of your net. You know, if you're wanting to put money away for retirement or other things, all that, those decisions enter in and it affects you and the, the amount you're willing to spend for a house. The mistake, you know, I see residents um, make when they're looking for houses. There, there are many of them that want to buy their um, final home during residency. And you know what you're really looking for, I think, during residency is not your final home, but either a home that you can sell when you move in three to five years, or you know, a home that's going to be a good investment that you, that could be a good rental property. And you know, the nicest properties out there don't always meet that eligibility. So. Um, again, I think those are things you want to really listen. You want to find a good real estate agent, first of all, who can help you make a good per- purchase. Um, you know, you don't want to buy a house probably on a major road. You don't want to buy a house you know, with heavy traffic. You want to buy a house that, you know, is going to be easy to sell. I mean, if a house has been on the market for a year, there's probably some reasons why other people haven't liked it. And so you got to ask those hard questions. Is, you know, is there something about this house? It's going to make it hard to sell when I need to resell it. So let's say you decide that it's the right thing for you. You want to buy it. Let's talk about financing. What are the different options for either someone about to start residency or someone who just became an attending? Because I think a lot of the advantages of the, the physician-specific loans are, you know, they don't, they don't count the debt and... Uh, less of a down payment. So if you've been attending for a couple of years, the those advantages usually go away. So let, let's talk about someone who needs to take advantage of a physician-specific loan or an FHA loan, um, if they, or maybe they're a veteran, they might have those options available. What are the different options and why would you choose one over another? Yeah, so we'll start with um, doctor loans. So the thing to understand about doctor loans, most of the doctor loans, like you stated, don't take into account educational debt. Um, if the loan did take into account a- educational debt, many um, residents would not be able to buy a house because their um, their debt um, to loan value would be way too high. So one of the advantages of doctor loans, they don't take that into account. Um, another advantage of a doctor loan is that you can get 100% financing. So most residents have not saved money to where they can put down a decent um, down payment. You know, typically with most loans, you have to put down a minimum of 3% um, down payment, and that's not including your closing costs. So, again, you have to have a 3% saved um, to be able to do that. 
Um, the other nice thing um, about um, a doctor's loan is that you avoid private mortgage insurance. You hear the term PMI, a private mortgage insurance, and that is a fee that's tacked onto your loan until you have 20% of the loan paid off. So if you're able to put down 20% down payment, you can avoid PMI. But the nice thing about doctor's loan, you have no PMI starting at 100%. So typically, for most, you know, residents um, that have not saved any money, you know, the doctor's loans are probably the way to go. Now, if you have money saved up and you're able to put down a down payment, then you definitely want to look at the other type of loans, too, to see if you can get a better rate or a better um, deal. And the reason that they have this PMI is because if you're not putting down much, then you're considered higher risk. So the way that they mitigate this risk is by charging you more. But historically, doctors are a safe bet. And correct me if I'm wrong, the national default rate is somewhere a little over 4%, whereas for doctors, it's somewhere between 0.2 and 0.4%. Is that is that correct? I don't know those stats. I mean, I agree with you that they're a lower risk. But again, like you said, the whole point of the mortgage insurance goes back to the mortgage crash you know, back in 2007, 2008. That PMI helped protect the banks when people could no longer um, pay their monthly mortgage payments. And you started seeing foreclosures and short sales. Um, so it's, it's, it's to protect the bank um, in the end. So you're paying for their insurance against the risk that they're taking on you. Correct. Okay. Interesting. So are there any other advantages to to taking a doctor loan? Or it's the those those are the two, the no down payment and the um and the lack of PMI. And yeah, and then like you said, you know, no, not taking in the educational debt. But, I mean, those are the three main advantages. Tip sometimes with doctor loans, the rates are higher because of of, of that. So, you know, many times if you're able to put money down, you may be able to get a better rate. So that's why, you know, you want to look at other products if you can, because you, you may be able to get better rates and, and better terms. You know, the mistake that anybody makes looking at a house, they just look at the rate. You also have to look at what the bank's charging you in points and other expenses, because sometimes the reason you have a low rate is because they're charging you all of the fees. So it's kind of the whole package. You got to look at everything. You can't just look at the rate and um, making your decision on which loan to go with. So they mitigate their risks in another way. You're saying if they, because they have, if they have higher interest rates for you, then you might not have to pay, they might be ignoring your loans, not having to pay PMI, but now they're charging you a higher interest rate in order to mitigate those risks, make it, make it a Correct. better deal for them. Okay. That's interesting. Or they'll just hide the, that in fees. Correct. So you just have to, you know, look at the total picture. That's what you have to do with, you know, all these loans. And the other thing that's really important, um, you know, during residency, most people know how long they're going to be in a town. So let's say you're doing an ENT residency, you know, you're going to be in a town for five years. Well, you have a choice when you're getting a loan, whether you're going to do an adjustable rate mortgage, which is known as an ARM or a fixed rate. And, um, you know, I, I'm personally a big fan of the adjustable rate mortgages. You know, most likely you're only going to be in a city for a certain amount of time. So, for example, ENT, you know, you're going to be there five years. I, I personally would like a seven-year arm um, rather than like a five-year arm. The five-year arm, you know, if something happens, you decide to stay a little bit longer. You're, you you got a chance that your rate can go up. You know, the seven year hedges your bet bets a little bit and gives you a little bit more time if something changes and you know, you need a little bit longer with that loan for whatever reason. So I like I like the adjustable rate mortgages because the rate's usually lower than the fixed rate. And again, if you know you're only gonna be in the area for short term, then I, I think they can be a good choice. Could you just describe what what an adjustable rate mortgage is? So if a fixed rate mortgage, you have the same interest rate for the life of the loan. And that's it, right? And so when you take out correct most the uh, many many mortgage my mortgage on my house is we have a thirty year mortgage it's a fixed rate mortgage, but for the adjustable rate mortgage, how does that work? Yeah, so so I'll start again with the fixed rate. So the fixed rate mortgage the the most the type of ones that most people get is usually the thirty year fixed or fifteen year fixed. So the rate of the loan is fixed over fifteen years or thirty years. Um, typically. Um, 
we, you know, with the, the, with the fixed rate, the rates are a little bit higher than the adjustable rate mortgages. Um, with the adjustable rate mortgage, you have products that are three year adjustable rates, five years, seven years. And typically the shorter the term, the lower the rate. So you're going to get a better rate. So let's take a five year adjustable rate mortgage. So you're going to get the same rate for the first five years. And then after that five years, your rate is going to adjust. So if interest rates have stayed the same from when you got the loan, it's probably not going to change much. If they've gone down, they, um, they may go down. The big risk is when they go up. So if you get into a period when rates go up dramatically from the beginning of when you get your loan, you could really see a big change. They typically have caps um, with each one. So you want to understand what the cap is, how much. But again, that's where you really can get hurt if you, you know need still need that mortgage. You can always, you know, with an adjustable rate mortgage or a fixed rate, you can um, you can refinance it. Um, it's needed, but again, you know, the cost with that, you know, may outweigh the benefit. So again, it's a numbers game to figure all that out. But that sounds like it makes sense for someone who's going to have, like you said, an ENT residency is five years long. You can lock in a, a lower rate than a fixed rate for those five years on the adjustable rate mortgage. And then when you're done, even if the rate goes up, either you offload, you sell the property, or at that point, you're making an attending salary. So even if the rate goes up, it, it, it won't be as devastating as if you were still making a resident salary. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think what you want to ask yourself, you know, you want to ask yourself some hard questions when you're deciding on the product. You know, one is, do you, do you think you want to get rid of this house when you leave? So if you say, if you know, Hey, I'm definitely not going to want to keep this house. And either if I stay in this town, I want to, get a bigger, better house, then adjust war rate probably makes sense. The other question to ask yourself, like we talked about earlier, you know, do I want to start building my portfolio of passive properties and do I want to make this into a rental property? If you want to make this into a rental property when you finish up, then you, it probably makes a lot more sense to, to get a fixed rate mortgage um, so you know what your costs are going to be throughout the whole term. So, if you can ask yourself those questions, it will help you a lot deciding whether you should get an adjustable or fixed rate mortgage. And for those that are listening that thinks that that is just a crazy idea, holding onto a property and and renting it out. Um, since you're listening to this podcast, you probably listen to other podcasts and there, there are plenty out there about the benefits of uh, real estate investment. And you can find a company to manage the property for you for a fee. So like, like Dr. Ramey said, it's a great way to start building a portfolio because then you have passive income through that property. Another thing that's discussed on, on the physician-specific podcasts and blogs is um, living like a resident. So it actually makes sense right, when you become an attending to not spend like an attending immediately. So if you're in your resident apartment or resident house, it actually makes sense to stay there for a couple of years, continuing to live like a resident before you try and find that uh, big, beautiful house. And we had the frugal physician on a couple of episodes ago where, where she talked about what happens when you try and buy that big, beautiful house so quickly and how stressful that can be. So, um, you know, this is not what, a, this is not how a lot of people think when they're starting in residency. I'm going to start accumulating a portfolio of investment properties, but there are tons of benefits to, uh, to, to having that mindset. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, you know, I said, we see, I see that a lot. There's a lot of, you know, a delayed gratification in our field that, you know, we tell ourselves we've worked so hard for all these years, you know, we deserve, you know, this nice car, we deserve this nice house. And I think from a, you know, an investment standpoint, that's a surefire way to not get rich or to build your wealth is to, you know, think, that, you know, I think a better way to, to think if you want to build your wealth, if you want to take, you know, the fire principle, which is, you know, financial independence, retire early, you know, think more like you're saying, you know, is this a good investment? And, you know, would it make more sense for me to, when I buy my second house to get one that's a lesser cost so I can keep this rental property and start seeing some passive um, income accumulate? So let's say you've you've found the apartment or you found the property you want to um this is where you want to live for residency but you have 
so little money in the bank. Just because you're not making a down payment doesn't mean there's no upfront cost. So, so talk to me about what those upfront costs are, even when you're talking about zero down payment. Yeah. So a lot of people, when you buy your first house, you don't realize that you know there are closing costs associated with buying a house, and you know typically those closing costs can run around three percent of the house's value. You know, one thing you can do with these closing costs, if you have a good realtor, you can ask the sellers to pay um, the closing costs. So. If you don't have cash where you can afford to pay that, you can ask the sellers to pay your closing costs. Typically, let's say that your closing costs are going to be $5,000. You ask the seller to pay the $5,000. And in exchange for that, the seller may want to increase the price of the house for $5,000. So that's okay. It's kind of, you're paying just, you know, you're getting them to help you pay for that. And, you know, a lot of residents are in that um, scenario. They just don't have money to you know, pay closing costs for down payment. So um, that's one thing to think about that, you know, if you're saying, hey, I really want to buy, but I don't have any money, you know, saved up. That's one way, you know, to be able to do that. That, that seems a little shady <laughs> that you're, that you're, <laughs> you don't have the money for closing costs and you're still there because it's getting wrapped up into your mortgage. So you're still, they're still, the, the seller is still getting their $5,000 you're just paying them. Basically, they're loaning you that five thousand dollars because you're um, you're wrapping it up into the cost of the mortgage, and then they're paying those upfront costs. I guess I guess that works. I guess it's not so shady now that I think about it. Well, I mean, you know, there's you know, there's two ways to look at it. You know, one way, you know, a lot of financial advisors will say, you know, that's a good way to do it. You know, roll that five thousand dollars into your loan. You're paying four to five percent on it. You know that's not you know high interest rate. If you look at historically, and you know a lot of them would say that you know you can invest your money and do with that. Other people, financial advisors, would say if you don't have that four to five thousand dollars, you probably shouldn't be buying a house. So you know there's two sides of the coin, and people look at it differently. So it really you know depends on you know the way you invest and you know um, making that decision. And let's say you bought your house during residency and now you've become an attending you, because you've made so little, you've been living, hopefully not paycheck to paycheck, but close to it. So you don't have much in savings. Now you've got this bump in salary and you want to buy a second property. uh, Now that you've become an attending and you still have the loans, could you use a second physician loan? Is that possible? It is. Um, and if you go to our site, drmoves.com, we've written some articles on that topic, that there are certain banks that will let you use doctor loans to buy investment properties and second homes. Not all the banks do that. So there are only certain ones that will allow you to do that, but it is possible. And we have a list of you know banks that will allow you to do that. Okay. So you're in Charleston. So let's say I'm buying, I'm, I'm starting my um, residency in Tallahassee, how do I find um, a real estate agent? So one of the things we've tried to do with DR Moves is make it easy on the doctors to find a real estate agent. You know, going back to my initial story, um, we made the mistake of not asking other people for references of the realtor. So, you know, a minimum, you need to talk to people who live in that town and say, hey, who did you use? Did you have a good experience? Um, even better than that, if you're a physician, you know, talk to other physicians. Because again, there, you know, in our town of Charleston, um, we have, you know, about 6,000 houses on the market and we have about 4,000 realtors. And so there's about, you know, almost one realtor per house. And so they're everywhere. And so not all the realtors in Charleston know anything about working with a physician. So as a physician, you know, what you really want to do is find a realtor who has experience working with physicians because it is different. Um, there's many realtors out there that don't know anything about doctor loans. And it, again, it's good to have a realtor out there who understands the difference between a doctor loan and a regular loan. So what we've done at DR Moves is we have made it easy on people. Um, pretty much they can send us an email, call us up, and we'll match them with a realtor in whatever city they're going to. And what we've done 
is we've, uh, we go and interview the realtors um, before and find out how many doctors they work with. We look at um, some of their reviews. And again, we try to find realtors who have a lot of real estate, kind of like I do with the doctor. You, know, you want to, if you're going to have a knee replacement, you don't want somebody that's just done five knee replacements. You want somebody that's done a lot of knee replacements. Same thing with real estate. You don't want a realtor who has just started in the profession. You want somebody who has done a lot of transactions because it, real, the thing about real estate is that you know for many transactions, you know you may not need a realtor, but when you get into a bad situation, you don't know what to do. The, the realtor's worth their weight in gold to say, "Hey, this is what we need to do to get you out of this bad situation." Having a realtor with experience is worth its weight in gold. Um, you know, I'll share a story with you. Um, we were working with a resident who had a contract to buy a newly built house. Um, it was about five days away from closing on the house. The house get, got hit by lightning and caused significant damage to the electrical system. So, again, you're buying your first house. What do you do? Um, if you work in with your aunt, who's a realtor that maybe sells one house a year, they're probably not going to be too much of help to you. But if you're working with a realtor who does, you know, over a hundred transactions a year, they probably run into something similar, or at least they know people who can give you good advice on how to deal with that situation. And then, uh, I see you also have a resource on the website for finding doctor loans to, uh, based on your region. Yeah. So you can go and search, um, by state. Um, who what um, companies do doctor loans and you know compare rates. So most states have you know multiple banks doing that, and then you know we have. Um, they're also you know I think you know this program is mainly focused on doctors, but we have found um, banks that will do them for pharmacists and physical therapists and other um, you know um, dot um, medical professions out there. So you know. In general, the doctor loans are for physicians, but there are some out there, you know, for um, other medical professionals too. And I see you have a, a couple of other sources on your website that I think bear mentioning. If you want to discuss those briefly, filling out medical surveys, become a, becoming a medical reviewer, unrelated to real estate, but certainly very helpful. Yeah. So what what we're trying to do with that too is, you know, all that stuff's kind of associated with the process of moving. You know, you're looking for jobs, you're looking for ways to make extra income. And um, I've been doing medical surveys now for over 15 years and you know, accumulated, you know, a large list of companies that do this. And, um, you know, it, we've had a list on there. And, you know, what you have to do is just go and um, find out with each company there. You know, I always get the question of, well, how do I decide which company to sign up? You know, what I did when I was in residency, I signed up with most of them. And what I found is that, you know, certain companies work with certain specialties more than others. So it's good to be signed up with multiple ones. And, you know, you can earn significant, you know, spending cash doing these surveys. Um, you know, over the years, I've earned probably ten to $15,000 a year doing these surveys. So, you know, it depending on your specialty, there's definitely a need for, um people doing surveys. We also have information on about doing medical reviews, um, telemedicine, um, and, you know, other ways to earn extra income. Um, expert with witnessing is something else that we have on there. Is there anything else that you, that you wanted to mention that we didn't discuss yet today? No, I, just, I think the you know, main thing that, you know, I want to get back to is, you know, preparing, you know, when you decide that you want to buy a house. Again, it's a very emotional decision, and many doctors get out there and they buy houses that they can't afford or are too expensive at their time and training. And when the banks qualify you for a loan, they're not always looking at your budget to see what you can afford to pay for. They're, they're always giving you the maximum they think you can afford. And so, again, that doesn't mean that it's going to be comfortable for you if you go with the maximum they're recommending. So. You know, to to make a good decision, you always want to sit down and, and think about a budget. Yeah, they recognize that your likelihood of defaulting is extremely low. Uh, but as you're avoiding default, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not miserable because you're stressing over the not only the mortgage payments, but all the upkeep that goes along with having a, a more expensive home. So as long as you're making your payments there, 
they're fine. They're not uh, invested in in some of the misery that's associated with uh, with with living paycheck to paycheck. So I think that's 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 an excellent point. Yeah, and, and again, if you're married, you know you, you want to think you know long term too. You know, do you, you and your spouse both want to work? You know, because if you get pre-fraught qualified on both your salaries and, you know, one of the people decide to stay home, it, it may be very hard to maintain that um, payment. So, again, you, you want to think, you know, hey, am I going to start having kids in three to five years? And, and what am I going to do with that? So, again, if those people come to work, then that's great. But, again, if you have the plan that one person wants to stay at home, you want to try to make your initial decision on that, not on both people's salaries. Well, Dr. Remy, where, where can people find you? Yeah, so you can go to um, send me an email at info at drmoves.com. Happy to answer any questions. Again, I, we just want to be a resource. I've been very blessed in my career. And, you know, I, I feel like um, one of the things we didn't talk about that i um, been very fortunate at making good real estate decisions and have, you know, investment properties that are residential, commercial and even vacation rentals. And, um, you know, it's, it's been nice to get to a point to be able to pay off a lot of those properties and already seeing them, you know, be cash flow positive. And so it's nice to get to a point in your career where you work because you want to, not because you have to. And, you know, that's where, you know, I feel like I am at this point. And, you know, I'm only 45. And so, you know, I see that as a blessing. So, again, the reason I was able to get there was the decisions I made when I was 32 and 33 and 34. Making good decisions then will pay off in your 40s and 50s. So you just got to think about, you know, just making great decisions, you know, when you're going into being an attending. Well, I really appreciate you, appreciate you taking the time to, to talk on the podcast. And it has been very informative and it's been a pleasure. Thanks. It was a great talking to you tonight. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Find all previous episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts, and write us a review. You can also visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash physician's guide to doctoring. If you are interested in being a guest or have a question for a prior guest, send a message or post a comment.